You're about to see the very best of police detective work, but it's born out of the very worst of mankind. Cecilia Haddad was a young Brazilian woman, a successful mining executive who'd been living in Australia for a number of years. In 2018, she was murdered by a jealous ex-boyfriend. Marcelo Santoro was also from Brazil and it's where he fled to immediately after killing Cecilia. He probably thought he'd gotten away with his terrible crime, but he was wrong. On assignment for 60 Minutes, Nine's Christina Hearn reports Santoro didn't count on the resolve of New South Wales police officers to bring him to justice. Police emergency, this is Tammy. Where do you need the police, please? Hi, uh, Angelo Street, Woolwich, at the water. We've found a body in the water. The triple zero caller's distress is obvious and understandable. Okay, just stay on the phone with me. <laughs> Getting the police on the way as we're talking, okay? Just stay on the phone. <laughs> At a secluded beach in an affluent suburb on Sydney Harbour, Christine Baird and her husband have just found a dead body. <laughs> you don't know who this person is? <laughs> no. My husband's just holding the body floating upside down from the water. <laughs> As the operator asks more questions... I think it's a young woman. A young woman? Yeah, maybe about 20. Yeah. <laughs> the realisation of what might have happened becomes even more upsetting for Christine. I just think she's a young girl. I just yeah. Think I'm not. I'm just still sick for her family. I've got teenage daughters. I said, where is Cecilia? Where is she? She hasn't called. I knew something was up. Cecilia Haddad was 38. Independent, intelligent and loving life. She'd moved to Australia from Brazil four years earlier in 2014. On her very first day here, she'd met fellow Brazilians, Carol Camara and Rita Marcial. The trio became instant friends. Oh, just this beautiful, bright, um, happy, amazing woman. Yeah, she she was just so fun. A very strong woman. You just get inspired by being around her. You would know Cecilia was there because she just filled the whole space with her energy, with her laughter. It's been five years now since Cecilia died. But for Rita and Carol, it still feels like yesterday. As painful as the memories are, though, they want the world to know what happened to their beautiful friend. Because they're convinced talking about her murder might, in fact, save lives. But it's not easy. The what-ifs continue to haunt them. I wish I had called the police. I blame myself for what happened to Cesar. I would have done so much more, so much better for my friend if I knew she was in danger. Carol, you do know there's only one person to blame for her death. Yes. It's not you. It's this man caught on CCTV fleeing Australia 24 hours after the murder, who is solely to blame. Marcelo Santoro was a controlling and jealous ex-boyfriend who, unwilling to accept the end of a year-long relationship with Cecilia, decided to make her life hell, stalking and threatening her, even forcing himself into her apartment. She ran into the bedroom and she locked herself in and she got all the furniture she had around her and barricaded herself into the bedroom. And she was shouting at him to leave. He was punching the door and he was trying to go in, but always saying to her, I just, just want to talk to you. You just need to listen. 
Cecilia was loved for her compassion, but in some ways, it was her undoing. She refused to believe Santoro, who was also from Brazil, would ever physically harm her and wouldn't report him to the police. Perhaps knowing this, Santoro's harassment increased. A week before her death, Cecilia was desperate for a break and flew to Perth to visit Carol and Rita. I said to her, I said, don't go back. He's dangerous. He can do something to you. Don't go back to Perth, to Sydney. Stay here. Work from home. And she said, no, I need to be there for work. I need to go back. But when she got home to Sydney, there was another shock. Cecilia discovered Santoro had secretly cut himself a key to her apartment and had been letting himself in whenever he wanted. She called me straight away and she was so upset. And she was shouting on the phone and very distressed. And she said, I told him not to be in my apartment anymore. And I know he was here. I can smell him. I can see his hairs all over my white floor. And she was just really, really annoyed by this uh, situation. He was breaking into her apartment. He was clearly stalking her. Why didn't she go to the police? She didn't want him to have a record. She wanted him gone, but she didn't wish him bad. Cecilia was increasingly frightened. Audio messages she sent Carol reveal Centauro's obsession had reached a dangerous new level. So she says she's home now cooking some soup, but in the dark, because she doesn't want him to know that she's home. She was uh, taking a shower with the lights off, and then she goes to say, I know I'm being paranoid because I know he follows me. And that was a cry for help. Yeah, so it's heartbreaking. She obviously doesn't know the extent of the danger she's in. Exactly. She was afraid, but she thought she had the handle on him, uh, that she was in control. Sadly, she was wrong. To dodge Santoro, Cecilia stayed in hotels or with friends, but that just made him more frantic. The day before she was murdered, CCTV cameras captured him leaving his home and making repeated visits to Cecilia's apartment. On the Friday, he had about five trips down there right throughout the day and throughout the evening where he keeps going down, spends a bit of time, comes home, not for long, before he's out again. And it's quite striking, the, the stalking behaviour uh, that he's engaging in. For New South Wales police detectives, John Edwards and Hannah Packer, the warning signs about what was about to happen are all too obvious. Don't let it escalate. Don't put up with it. If there's behaviour that you're uncomfortable with, um, then, then put a stop to it early. And that's not just the victim, but their friends as well. On the day of her death, Cecilia was here at her apartment for the first time that week, after discovering that Santoro had finally booked a flight home to Brazil. In just four days' time, he was going to be out of her life forever. It's the relief she needed to finally feel safe enough to return home. Tragically, it would prove to be a fatal decision. One of the last things she said to me was, I will drive him to the airport. And I said, are you insane? Are you crazy? You're going to drive this man to the airport? And then she said, you don't understand, Carol. I need to see his back when he walks through that gate. I need to see him gone because I'll be free. She was a very strong woman, but in the end, her strength became her weakness. Absolutely. Cecilia would look after many people, but she obviously didn't look after herself enough. At 7.30 on the morning of April the 28th, 2018, 
Marcelo Santoro left his home and walked 10 minutes to Cecilia Haddad's apartment. He knew she was there. He buzzed in the apartment to try to come up and she said to him, you're not coming up. I'm not talking to you, just go. I don't want to see you. Um, and he wasn't taking that. He was not taking no as an answer. Santoro hung around Cecilia's apartment block for a few hours before finally, just after 10 a.m., he used his newly cut key to gain access. By seven minutes past 10, police believe Cecilia was already dead. And finally, I get this message, Carol, um, they found a body. And my world just stopped. It was very obvious to us, very start, that it was Santoro. And the friends and the family came forward very quickly. Homicide investigations are never easy. But straight away, New South Wales detectives, John Edwards and Hannah Packer, identified Marcelo Santoro as the prime suspect in the murder of Cecilia Haddad. He was her ex-boyfriend, but they still had to catch him. A task made more difficult because he'd fled to his homeland, Brazil, a country that doesn't have an extradition treaty with Australia. The problem there was that their constitution doesn't actually allow them to extradite their citizens. They then said, but if you want to send the brief here, they'll prosecute him in Brazil. And uh, the commissioner got on, straight on board with that. We were then committed to you know, uh, pulling a brief together and giving it to the Brazilians to prosecute. So you basically had to do all the police work and then hand it all over? Absolutely. The detective's task was to prove exactly what had happened to Cecilia and how. Piecing the crime together was a slow and painstaking process, but they had technology on their side. How crucial was that CCTV that you managed to get? Oh, super crucial and amazing. It, you know, for a jury to see something like that, it's not just talking about it, it's not just people giving that evidence to talk about it, it's a visual that, you know, paints a picture for them that they don't normally get to see. To determine Santoro's movements and link him to the secluded beach where Cecilia's body was found, police tracked his phone through the pings it made with mobile towers in the area. So up here, number two is Santoro's house. Number three is Cecilia Haddad's house. Santoro's phone has connect connected with a cell tower. So we believe he's driven down here uh, to the waterfront looking for somewhere to dump her body. You can see all those phone pings. He's driving all over. He's not doing the direct route to where he dumped the body. So he's looking for a place. Yeah, absolutely. So when he didn't find anywhere appropriate down here, he's driven, we believe, right round here, round Rod Point. Um, and again, these are all waterfront areas where he's looking for somewhere to dump the body. And we follow the phone all the way down. But in the game of proof, a map showing where his mobile phone went simply wasn't enough. They needed visual evidence and we sent police out to drive and literally look at every house, every business along the way, go and knock on the door, get their footage, um, and then over time, piece it together. Could you guess how many cameras you had to go through to piece that all together? Uh, hundreds. The effort was rewarded. Santoro was seen driving Cecilia's red Fiat in the hours after she was murdered. But even more importantly, the CCTV footage of the red Fiat was an exact match, both in time and location, to the tracking of Santoro's mobile phone. This is the side street beside her house. Uh, you'll see that's her car coming around the corner. And that's the first time we actually see the car. 
on this evening. As it drives along, it goes past a series of cameras. So this is Centuro driving Cecilia's car with her body in it? Uh, yes, uh, we, we believe so, yes. Uh, there it is very clearly. The last uh, shot we get of the car is that one. It's the second car there following along, coming round uh, the pub. Just a few hundred metres down the road, Santoro dumped Cecilia's body at around 7pm, nine hours after he killed her. Within 20 minutes, he was home again, but what he did next was even more staggering. The two CCTV cameras at Santoro's home recorded his every move. This is back at Santoro's house. You can see him here. He's walking across his forecourt and you can see the wet footprints that he's leaving behind. He's left his shoes on the beach and he's walking in wet socks, and which you can see on the video as it goes through. So that's his, the forecourt of his premises. He then walks around the back. There's another camera and you can see him here. Uh, he's walking to the door of his unit He's just opened the laundry door here and, and you can see he strips all his clothes off, puts them in the washing machine. He's trying to get rid of any evidence. A any evidence that there may be on them. You know, that was a real, yeah, we've got him moment. And he would have had no idea that that camera was there. I believe clueless to the fact the camera was there. But Santoro was clued in on some things. He used Cecilia's phone to text messages to some of her friends, saying she was going to the Blue Mountains. And to make the story more believable, after he dumped her body, he dumped her car at a local train station. However, once again, the CCTV cameras gave him up. That's it there, you see the red car? And we will track it um, across as many cameras as we can find, all the way across to the West Ride Railway Station commuter car park, where we ultimately find it a couple of days uh, afterwards. Early the next morning, before Cecilia's body was even found, Santuro knew he had to get out of the country. Jumping into an Uber, he headed to the airport. During the trip, in plain sight of the Uber driver, Santoro disposed of what would end up being the most important piece of evidence in this case, Cecilia's car keys. What did that Uber driver tell you? He ended up being quite a key witness. He was, um, he had a great memory, which was wonderful. Yeah, so if you could just tell us where you merged over. Yeah. And one of the main things that he told us was, in that travel, he drove over the Gladesville Bridge and as he drove over the Gladesville Bridge, Santoro asked him to, to travel on the left-hand side. As they were driving, he um, put the window down and then threw something out the window that the Uber driver said sounded like keys. I mean, this is a, a big bridge and there's actually barriers at the top. It is remarkably actually managed to throw the keys out. Yeah, that's right. And it's a far distance as well. He's, he's done a good effort to get them over. It was obviously pre-planned and he thought about it as, as he was approaching the bridge. It took police divers three weeks, but eventually they found Cecilia's car keys in the river. And there was no mistaking the iconic Christ the Redeemer key ring from her home city of Rio in Brazil. So by that stage, we had seized her car and um, had done our crime scene examinations. And when we took that key to the, to the car, magic, it, it opened the car. It really did uh, cement the case against him. Three months after she was killed, Brazilian police arrested Marcelo Santoro and charged him with the murder of Cecilia Haddad. But it would take another four years before Santoro's trial was heard in June this year, remarkably over just two days. Hannah, what was it like dealing with the Brazilian court system? We were told that it would probably be wrapped up in one day, possibly two. Um, something like this in Australia would have been weeks, possibly months, going through that evidence. Where jurisdiction that every witness comes forward and gives that evidence, whereas in Brazil, John and I were able to give 
a lot of that evidence and provide a lot of that evidence because of what we knew about the job. I think on the first night we were there till midnight um, and the second day till 2 a.m. in the morning by the time we had a result. During the trial, run largely on the evidence collected by New South Wales Police, Santoro ended up confessing to killing Cecilia, but claimed he didn't mean it. The jury didn't believe him though. He was found guilty of murder and was sentenced to 27 years in jail. For Cecilia's best friends, Carol Kamara and Rita Marciel, that wasn't anywhere near long enough. Yeah, he took away many lives. The life of a, a daughter, a life of an auntie, a sister, a friend that we were never going to have back. I cannot see him regretting that. You don't think he has any remorse? No. No. What he regretted was to be caught. Um, so we saw no sorrow in his words. He wasn't um, apologetic. He wasn't, he was just what he is. Yeah. He's a coward. He's a horrible person. And he's exactly where he deserves to be. Understandably, Cecilia's death has left everyone who loved her heartbroken. But five years on, Carol and Rita say there are still questions that must be answered. For most visitors, Sydney Harbour is spectacular. But not for Carol Kamara and Rita Marcial, who've travelled here from Perth. For them, it's a place of sadness, where their best friend, Cecilia Haddad, was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, Marcelo Santoro. Sydney is just where she, she was taken from us. And coming back here, it's... It's something that we, we must do to find closure and be able to move on. We haven't been given an opportunity to grieve our friend. I think of her floating on that river at night by herself and dying on the hands of that man. I cannot past that moment, I cannot move forward. Coming to the secluded beach where Cecilia's body was discovered is important. Carol and Rita need to grieve. Just had to think of her here by herself. In the dark, left alone. But they also want to meet someone they consider very special. Police emergency, this is Tammy. Where do you need the police, please? At the water. We found a body in the water. Christine Baird made the triple zero call after finding Cecilia. And the care she showed still means the world to Carol and Rita. We were just putting our boats in the water over there and as we were pushing them out, um, we just saw her lying in the water and she was lying face down, so we turned her over. She just looked so beautiful and so peaceful. It's something I hope you can take some comfort in that because obviously it wasn't a peaceful time for her, but when we found her, she looked peaceful. Yeah. It's sad. It's sad, but I'm, I'm so glad because I can see how beautiful you are. <laughs> and your heart so warm. Yeah, yeah. she needed She has a special, she has a special place. My children call her my lady in the river. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think he walked here and dropped her? Or do you think he went that way? Christine's words are enormously comforting, even five years on. A reminder, if ever it was needed, 
that Cecilia's short life mustn't be for nothing. Carol and Rita are determined to do whatever they can to make sure what happened to their beautiful friend stops happening to other women. I never saw Cecilia as the face of domestic violence. She was just this powerful woman. I speak up and talk to the police because we are not superwoman and we can't really protect everybody. But there are people that can. Be the voice for the ones that think they don't need help. Do you think if there was police intervention that Cecilia would be alive today? I think so. I really do. John Edwards and Hannah Packer agree. Their message is also clear. They know it can be hard, but they want to encourage people to get help, even when the victims think they're OK. The position of the friends is, is very difficult because you don't want to betray the trust. You can give them advice, but when do you go against their wishes and go to the police regardless of what your friend wants? That's a very, very difficult situation. But certainly, if she had understood what the police would have done for her, and maybe that's the role of friends, trying to put her in contact with people who actually know what the police can do for you. There is not a day that goes by that I don't think what Cecilia would be doing. Cecilia is not a floating body in, in the river. She's a force of nature. She's someone that you need to look and think of as an amazing, amazing person that came here to teach us so many lessons and will be forever loved by us. Domestic violence is a curse in Australia. As Christine reported, police are there to help. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.